Welcome. Welcome. Today we're going to discuss estimating a population proportion. The sample proportion is the best point estimate of the population proportion. A point estimate is a single value or point used to approximate a population parameter. Example 1, Game of Thrones. The Pew Research Center conducted a survey of 4,083 adults and found that 11% of them tuned in for the Season 7 premiere episode of Game of Thrones. What is the best point estimate, P, of the population proportion? Well, here we have our sample. And this describes our sample. Though, as any Game of Thrones fan would argue, this is probably a very much a low ball estimate. That said, what is the best point estimate, P, of the population proportion? The best point estimate is the sample proportion. The sample proportion is P hat, and that is equal to 0 0.11. Next, let's discuss confidence intervals. A confidence interval is a range or interval of values used to estimate the true value of a population parameter. The confidence level is a probability often expressed as the equivalent percentage value that the confidence interval actually does contain the population parameter assuming that the estimation process is repeated a large number of times. So it's this that will come in handy for computations. Most common choices for confidence level are 90%, 95, or 99. What is alpha for each of these confidence levels? So for a 90% confidence level, we'd have 90% as a decimal is equal to 1 minus alpha. So alpha equals one-tenth. Similarly, for 95% confidence level, alpha equals five hundredths, point zero five. And for a 99% confidence level, alpha would equal just one hundredth. Let's look at example two. Example two, interpreting a confidence interval. The 90% confidence interval for the proportion of students with a GPA of 3.5 or greater is below, right here. Interpret this confidence interval. We have a 90% confidence that the interval, and that is from here to here, contains the true population of students with a GPA of 3.5 or greater. Let's look at the top of the next page. Interpreting a confidence interval. We have to be very careful when interpreting confidence intervals. There are lots of incorrect ways to interpret a confidence interval. If you saw, say, this confidence interval here, you wouldn't say 90% of the proportion lies in this interval. That would be incorrect. A better way to phrase this is we are 90% confident that the interval from here to here actually does contain the true value of the population proportion. And the idea is, suppose you go out and construct you know, take one sample of people and you create a confidence interval. And you might be between, say, here and here. And then you go out and do it again. And the next confidence interval might be here and then here and so on, right? 
you do this enough times. So let's say you do it a hundred times. So let's pretend there are a hundred confidence intervals right here. If you have a 90% confidence, then you notice this one's here. This one is not, sorry, this, this confidence interval here does not contain the true population proportion. So if you say constructed different samples, say a hundred of them, of them for 90% confidence, you'd expect 10 of them to not contain the population proportion, but 90 of them would contain the population proportion. That said, we can use confidence intervals informally to compare data sets that are or different data sets, but when they overlap, the overlapping should not be used for making formal and final conclusions about any equality of proportions. You can definitely use confidence intervals to test claims about data sets being different, but not about being the same. So more on that later. Well, on hypothesis testing specifically later. Let's move on to the margin of error. So the margin of error is the maximum distance between the sample proportion and the true value of the population proportion. Let's look at example three. Example three, alternative forms for confidence intervals. So this 90% confidence interval for the proportion of students with GPA of, GPAs of 3.5 or greater from previous examples is this. What is the margin of error? And using this margin of error, rewrite the confidence interval in this form. So the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error so again, this is the point estimate. And this is the margin of error. And in general, when you see a question asking you to rewrite, it's really asking you for the point estimate and the margin of error. So let's do that. But before I do that, I have to fix a quick typo here. If you have the old version of the notes, please correct it to look like this, p hat plus or minus e. Now let's look at this example and start with a sketch of a number line. Here is the lower bound of the confidence interval. Here is the upper bound. And here would be the midpoint. Now our midpoint is our point estimate. When we add our margin of error, we end up with the upper bound. When we subtract our margin of error, we end up here at the lower bound. So let's start by finding our point estimate using the midpoint formula we know from algebra, which is simply to add these two values and divide them by two. point estimate, 0.16. Now, to find the margin of error, you would use this formula. You'd start with the max, subtract the minimum, then divide by 2. So your margin of error is as follows. Please pause your video and try part B independently. Okay, you should be up to this point now. So if you notice for both parts A and B, we have our point estimates and we also have our margin of error. So now we can write these in this form. For part A, we would write 0 0.16 plus or minus 0 0.6, excuse me, 0 0.603. And for part B, we would write 0 0.2638 plus or minus 0 0.0819. A standard C-score can be used to distinguish between sample statistics that are likely to occur and those that are unlikely to occur. 
In other words, they are borderline values that separate events that are likely to occur by chance from events that are unlikely to occur by chance, such as C-score is called a critical value. This number, and it's a Z with a subscript of alpha over two, is a critical value. That is a Z-score with the property that it separates alpha over two of the tail on the right, so here, from the left of the standard normal distribution. So this score tells us alpha, oh, So when you see this notation, just know it is a z-score here, and you'll have alpha over 2 area on the right. And it separates this area from everything else over here on the left. Let's turn to the top of page 64. Example 4 is an activity that is best worth worked independently. So I'm going to do this first part with you, and it's incorrectly labeled part E. If you have the updated notes, yours will not have those typos. So I'm going to talk you through part A, walk you through that, then I'm going to have you pause your video and try parts B, C, and D independently. And let me scroll down so you can see part D. So you're going to fill in your values from parts A through C in this table. That said, let's work on part A together. Find alpha and the critical value Z alpha over two associated with a 90% confidence level. If you recall, for a 90% confidence level, we know that alpha is found with this formula, 0.9 equals 1 minus alpha, and with a little algebraic manipulation we see that alpha equals 1 minus 0 0.9, and I should add this 0 is not necessary, I use it since sometimes my decimal points are too light, so I like to have a 0 on the left to remind me that I have a decimal point there. This makes alpha just a tenth. Now that we know alpha we can find the z score, z alpha over 2, so let's make a sketch here of our standard normal curve. And here's our mean. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And we want about how much area? Now let's figure this out. Z alpha over 2, well we know alpha is 0.1, so Z 0 0.05, so we want So we want the Z-score separating 0 0.05 area on the right of the standard normal curve. So we're starting off with an area and we want a z-score, so let's use inverse norm. And let's make a guess to where that's going to be. So we're going to have some z-score, some z-score, a, such that we have 0 0.05 area here. And if you remember, when you use inverse norm on your calculator, Inverse norm wants to know the area on the left, so you have to do 1 minus 0 0.05. And you end up with the following. Which you can round to 1.645. So now I'm going to be more certain. This area is 0 0.05 and A is equal to 1.645. So this is my z-score that separates 5% area, let me write that in a neater matter, 5% area on the right. So try the same thing for part B. I suggest you draw a sketch for part B and part C. So please pause your video now.
Please pause your video, complete parts B through D, then continue the video. Your page should look like this. So the critical value associated with a 95% confidence level is here, a z-score of 1.960. A critical value associated with a 99% confidence interval would be here. There is a typo in the book. The book uses 2.575 and that's just a rounding mistake as you can see right here. I would use the mistake version when you're working in my math lab, however, because they do reference this incorrect value. Now for part D, you should have this table completely filled in now, and this will be useful. I would refer to it down the line. For a 95% confidence level, your alpha is 0.1 and your Z, excuse me, your critical value is 1.645. For a confidence level of 95%, your alpha is 0 0.05 and your critical value is 1.960. And of course, for 99% confidence, you have 100th and 2.576, but use the incorrect value from the book. Let's move on to the margin of error formula. You can compute the margin of error directly Let's take a moment to write down what every value is. Let's turn to the top of page 65. So here on the top of page 65, you'll have two methods for constructing a competence interval for a population proportion. You can compute you can find the point estimate and compute the margin of error, or you can use your calculator, one prop Z int, and enter these values. Let's look at part A from example five. A Pew Research Center poll of 1,007 randomly selected adults showed that 85% of respondents know what Twitter is. Find the margin of error that corresponds to a 95% confidence level. So of course, let's start with our critical value for a 95% confidence level. Check your table from the previous page and you'll use 1.96 as your critical value. Now 85% of respondents knowing what Twitter is, that is our p hat. So our q hat is 1 minus 0 0.85. And we're dividing that all by the sample size of, size of 1,007 and you will get 95%. Now that we have our margin of error, let's find the 95% confidence interval estimate of the population proportion. So we can write it like this, which is You can also alternatively write it like this. And in that case, use your calculator. And finally, we can write it as, and of course, we already did this computation here, that arithmetic, and here. So we're basically done with this last case.
Based on the results, can we safely conclude that more than 75% of adults know what Twitter is? Well, where is 75%? So if I were to draw a number line, 75% would be here. And if you notice, 82% would be about here. And 0 0.8721 would be about there. And we have we are 95% confident that the true population proportion lies here. So this is definitely larger than 0.75. So we can definitely safely conclude that more than 75% of adults know what Twitter is. Because the confidence interval is likely to contain, oh, let me scoot this over. Because the confidence interval of 0.8279 and 0.8721 is likely to contain the true population proportion, it appears that more than 75% of adults know what Twitter is. Part D, let's write a statement that accurately describes the results and includes all of the relevant information. According to a Pew Research poll, 85% of 1,007 randomly surveyed adults know what Twitter is. In 95% of such polls, that is if we polled a sample, a random sample of the same size over and over again, we'd expect that in 95% of those polls, the true population percentage should change by no more than 2.21% in either direction. And if you're wondering where this comes from, this is from our margin of error here. So 2.21% larger than this and 2.21% smaller than this. Let's look at example six. Example six, if 230 out of 600 surveyed adults plan to tune in during the Game of Thrones season eight premiere in 2019, find a 90% confidence interval estimate for the percentage of all adult, adults planning on tuning in Interpret your confidence interval. If HBO claims that half of all adults planning on watching are planning on watching this premiere, is their claim correct? So first let's create our confidence interval. And let's start by identifying everything we know. P hat is X over N. And our X, well let's start with our N. Our N is the total number of adults surveyed here. And this is our proportion, or sorry, excuse me, our number of adults that meet the criteria that is planning on tuning in. So we can consider X the number of successes. And in this case, the success is they tune in during the Game of Thrones season eight premiere. And is a sample size. Now we have our confidence level of 90%. As a decimal, this is 0 0.9. So let's get out our calculator. You're going to go to stat, over to tests, and then down to part letter A, which is 1 prop Z int. Your screen on your calculator should look like this. So if you notice, we put in our N, we put in our X, and we put in our confidence level as a decimal. And this is what your calculator should show once you're done with this step. So if you notice, here is our confidence interval. So I'm rewriting this. No, technically 42%. So HBO's claim that half of adults are planning on tuning in is likely not correct. Since if you notice, if here's our number line, here's 35%. Here is 42%. And here's 50%. If half adults of adults were planning on tuning in, then our confidence interval should include 50%, but it does not. Our confidence interval is below 50%, so we can say that HBO's claim is likely not true. So to recap, our confidence interval should look like this. And our interpretation. And of course, HBO's claim is likely not correct.
Let's look at the last page of this section. Suppose we want to collect sample data to estimate some population proportion with a certain margin of error. How many sample items should we obtain? And now I didn't type the hat here, but that needs a hat. This needs a hat. And these all need hats. If the point estimate is known, then you also know Q hat. So you would use this formula. For the case in which we do not know our point estimate, I'm going to explain why we use these values using a table. Take a moment to sketch this table on your paper. And I've just picked some values for p hat. Notice I start at a tenth and I go up all the way to 0.9. So fill in the blanks here. What would q hat be in this first case? I'll help you out in this first case here. Since p hat equals 1 tenth, then q hat equals 1 minus 1 tenth of which is 0 0.9. So please fill in the remainder, excuse me, please fill in the remainder of this column. Now that that's filled in, let's discuss why I'm asking you for these products in this row. Well, if you notice, this product's going to go in the numerator of my formula. And I want to estimate my sample size as large as possible. So in order to make the numerator as large as possible, and again, the numerator has this multiplied in there, we need to have the largest possible product. So take a moment and fill in this column here with those products. Now, of all these values in this column, which one is the largest? 0.25 is the largest, and it is the product of 1 half and 1 half, which is why we use 1 half for both of these values. So now we would rewrite this formula using 0.5 and 0.5, and we get A survey was conducted to determine the percentage of car owners who would pay to put nitrogen in their tires. It supposedly leaks at a slower rate than air, which keeps the tire pressure at an ideal level. How many randomly selected car owners should be surveyed? Assume we want to be 95% confident that the sample percentage is within 3% of the true percentage of all car owners who would be willing to pay for nitrogen. Notice that no population proportion is given. We're not told anything about a certain amount of the population being told or using nitrogen in their tires. So we use So what is e squared? Notice they give us 3%. We want to be within 3% of the true percentage of all car owners who would be willing to pay for nitrogen. So that's our e. A bunch of ones repeating in your calculator. So round it up to the nearest whole number. And I say round up because you can't have 0.111111 of a person but a sample size of 1,067 may be slightly too small, so to be on the safe side, round up to 1,068. So our n, our sample size is 1,068. This concludes the lecture.